I think it would be a nice uh, model to study flagella machinery. Uh, in the fruit fly, we want to target the telomerase gene. Uh, in part one, we would target the 5' end of the first exon for a knockout. In part two, we would use homology directed repair to insert a strong promoter. It's like a huge project. <laughs> <laughs> really good, good job. job. <laughs> So we were uh, looking for revolutionary and we we're planning to create humans deleting all those cancer genes and aging genes in order to produce longer life people and produce more research and do it CRISPR. Okay, so yeah. I go back again. We may can do is one more round with mechanism and algae and the biotic application. So I want to use algae for biofuel. So what I've thought about is make it produce more lipid. So I can all right, well, this isn't going to be original anymore, but I was going to use yeast to make biofuels through uh, <laughs> cellulose and feedstocks to digest them and make biofuels. Uh, so there are a lot of flies, not that many bees, so I figured why not put flies in two pollinators? interesting that we are all happy. <laughs> so I'm looking at a human being that we can be engineered that is always happy. Just have a sweet turn you on. We are happy always. Just have a sweet turn you on. So I'm So we really need to wrap this up, but let's be happy. Let's just clap for our cool ideas. <laughs> The wings of flies and all of them. Oh, it's fine. Really? Yeah. 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 Ye
This mice is expressing protein, the green fluorescent protein from jellyfish. They will explain why they did this, but it's definitely useful for research. But if you look at all the applications, all the research on CRISPR, most of them are about medicine, about fighting against cancer, viral diseases, and genetically inherited diseases. There are some efforts to commercialize CRISPR. In fact, it's a, it's a competition right now to use CRISPR and build companies and build technologies. These four companies are the ones that first started to commercialize CRISPR. They started as private startups, but now they are public companies. It took them two, three years to go from a private company to a large company that can go into pub go public and sell their shares in the stock exchange. Those that are familiar with uh, companies and how this process happens from private to public, they know that it takes years of effort and investment and uh, lots of politics till a company can be big enough to go in public. But these companies, they did it very quickly. It's just because the researchers in this company created so much value and they created so much hype that this, these companies could grow and four of them together, they worth more than billions of dollars. There are big companies, big ventures, and big names behind each of these companies. For example, Editas is uh, backed by Bill Gates and Google. There are also private and startups, the private companies and startups working on CRISPR. Caribo, Poseida, they work on cancer, H. Norea, they work on viral diseases, Exonics, they work on muscle or dystrophy. But I want to point out these two companies or two startups eGenesis and Illegal Bioscience. eGenesis is a very cool and when you hear the story, you will know why it's cool. This company is working on generating human organs from pig. So basically, by CRISPR, they want to take all the genes that are related to pig, specifically for pig, they want to take it out, and then use that organ from pig for human and transplant it to human. And then, illegal bioscience, this company is important because if you look at their co-founders, they are so young. They are like recently graduates uh, from academic. And they want to work on designing nanobots that are able to kill, like target and kill on the pathogenic, the antibiotic resistant pathogenic bacteria. By the way, all this company, most of them, they are in the States, illegal bioscience is in is in France. As far as I know, there is no Canadian company that is developing a technology based on CRISPR. If you know, please let me know. by researchers. Behind the scene, there are companies that are providing that are supplying that technology. These are very important, and I have so much respect with, for the, all these companies, and there are other companies as well, but these are the major players. They are saving time for researchers and making life way easier for researchers to build their, to build what they want and validates their ideas. I, a part of the respect I have for these companies is, but is because they are democratizing gene editing. Now, what does it mean, democratizing? You may have heard about this, all these legal issue about patent of uh, patent on CRISPR and who wants to own it. But we are lucky; we have few years before the court decide who owns it. 
these companies are providing the kids and letting researchers and innovators to go there, go out there, validate their idea, and come up with new solutions. But when the, when the technology is monopolized by a few companies that are having the license, then it means it's only them that are generating for us. So these companies are doing a great job. In fact, IDT, the, one of them, is, uh, is the sponsor of this event, which will explain the uh, technical aspect of using CRISPR later during the workshop. I want to wrap up on CRISPR with this slide. Late in August, there was this huge news about these first gene therapy that was approved by FDA in the States. It was a work from, it was commercialized by Novartis, in, in fact it was a collaboration between Novartis and Intelia, one of the first companies worked on CRISPR. And basically the treatment is, it's, is for leukemia, they take T cell from, uh, from the patient, they edit the gene, they add the gene that, can, uh, that is a receptor for the antigen on the, the tumor cell. So when they, the protein gets expressed and the, the T cell is ready, they put it back into the patient's body and then the treatment, the, the T cell will attack the tumor and it's a sort of immunotherapy for the patients. The price point is $475,000. So almost like half a million dollar with 5% discount. I don't really know how this pharma coming up with the, these numbers and price points. There are logic for that. But what I know is that this number can only be broken down if there is competition. And something funny happened last night. I was trimming my slides for today. And I was Googling about this Novartis product and I just saw this breaking news on Forbes and all this industrial related news about this second gene therapy that was approved by FDA. It was last night. So it's Gilead is doing, is providing exact type of treatment, exact concept of CAR T therapy. It's the same uh, course of treatment, but this time with a price point of 373000 And believe me, if researchers work on this technology, if they compete, these price, price points will be broken down and this technology and these treatments, treatments will be more accessible to people. So everyone can benefit from these technologies, not only wealthy ones. So, my name is Mazad. I'm from District 3, I'm a biochemist. I'm coming from a diverse team at District 3 Innovation Center. We are the innovation hub of Concordia University. Um, District 3 is famous for bringing together all the stakeholders from industry, students, academic, innovators. What we want to do and what we are doing over the past four years, we are promoting innovation and entrepreneurship we have, a, we have proudly coached over 286 startups by now. We have had so many educational workshops on the business, on the technical side of um, generating an innovation in the business. We have close to 6,000 community members and we have generated a value of $35 million in startups uh, evaluation and also sales. We have two uh, major programs for you researchers or innovators. It's a launch and grow programs, which are basically, if a researcher, innovator comes to us having an idea, we help them to develop their idea, we help them to validate their idea, we help them to prototype, and then we help them to build a business around their idea. We have BioLab, it's a biological class two lab, it's in SP building, in the basement, S180. It's free to use by the startups that are getting coached at District 3. And it's using their, you know, there is no intellectual property and no uh, 
QIT is involved with using the lab or any services at this region, in fact. We have, we have several successful startups in life sciences, but I put two of them here. Ananda, which they are making these laboratory devices which you know, expand the survival of neurons in cell-based assays. And we also have Sensorial, which is, they are building this lab on the chip devices, and it will be used for biometric monitoring. They have closed a, a, a contract with um, Canadian Space Agency last year, and they are delivering the product that they are in the front phase of delivering. And yes, we don't want everyone to be entrepreneurs, but we believe all the researchers are problem solvers. Solvers. So we are offering residency programs, which are a platform to help to connect industry to students. We take challenges from industries, the challenges that these industries are having at the moment. We take those and we recruit a team of students to solve that problem. We have recently delivered 15 projects over the, the cohort of summer and our fall cohort is ongoing. If you want to visit District 3, the head office is in downtown. We have tours on Friday afternoons at 3 p.m. You just need to show up. It's at Faubourg Building at 6th floor. Uh, also, if you have any questions, this is my email, mazad at the 3 center CA. Uh, we'll be happy to help you guys. If you want to know what is the process of getting involved with District 3, as a researcher, stay around after the IDT talk. I will give you briefly uh, how things are, what is the process, and how you can get involved in this research. To, for the invite, I'm uh, proud to be associated with District 3 and to represent IDT. So, my name is Francois, I'm technical sales representative. And, uh, So uh, we always talk about CRISPR, that seems to be the buzzword, but where that, did that come from? Um, Dr. Svenwano, PI, based in University of Havana, not far from here, Quebec City, he was studying the interaction of the bacteriophages with the bacteria. He's working with their industry, and he was concerned because these bacteriophages, they spoil the bacteria to produce dairy, and it causes some issues. So during his studies, he noticed that he, in all bacteria, that has been long, known for a long time, there was some patterns that were called clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats that gave the name of CRISPR. And it, this is what was known to be in the bacteria, but they quite didn't know what it was for. So Dr. Moineau sequenced the, these sequences and uh, also the genome of the bacteriophage, and to his great surprise, he noticed that after a while, when bacteria was exposed to the bacteriophage, the sequence, some sequences of the genome were identical to some sequence of the repeat in the genomic DNA of the bacteria. So studying further, he found out that the complex protein called Cas or CRISPR-associated protein was involved in getting DNA from the bacteriophage and getting that as an additional spacer in the cluster of repeats. So studying again, we found out that that releases some guide RNAs. Uh, he called that some CRISPR RNAs. And the Cas9, another uh, Cas associated, associated protein, processed that and uh, stuck to the, the genomic DNA of the phage and was able to process it and cut it in parts. So the phage was sort of inactivated. So he found out that when it was an immune system from the, from the bacteria. So that became a great paper from a scientific point of view. And uh, I met him maybe four or five months ago and I was very impressed to meet him. I asked him bluntly, did you have any idea of the, the discovery you got? And he said, by by no means, I had no idea. I was interested in the scientific point of view. But someone else took the idea 
and top, we have the ability to target a specific sequence and cut at that side. So why couldn't we use that to edit genomes from other organisms? So the design, all you need is an RNA-guided endonuclease that would recognize the 20 nucleotide sequences just in front of a PAM site. This is a constant, this is NGG for any sequences followed by GG. So you need that 20 nucleotides with another structure, what we call the CRISPR RNA, plus another part that is tracer RNA that is always constant. This is what's closer to what was found in nature with the um, inside the bacteria. So that cause a blunt ended, you need the CRISPR and tracer RNA, the fat side, and the RNA guided and nuclease that sits on the double stranded DNA. So at this point, you may ask what IDT has to do with CRISPR. If some of you know about IDT, you'd probably say, okay, you sell PCR primers. Yes, we do. But uh, I'd like to show you how the company started with the entrepreneur that's named Dr. Joseph Walter. By Gold in Toronto, and in 1968, he won a Nobel Prize for his work with other collaborators in deciphering the genetic code. The methodology was cumbersome. It would literally take an army of most stocks many months just to synthesize a small number of fragments. Bob Lessinger, who was a professor at Northwestern University, which is where I went to graduate school, developed three very important improvements to the method of synthesis. One was to go to a triester chemistry, the other to do it on salt support, and the third was to change the phosphate to a phosphite methodology. So it was very fortunate to be able to work in Bob's lab. Many companies had the idea that individuals would want to do the synthesis in their own lab. But biologists want to do biology, they don't want to be doing chemistry. And ultimately, that gave rise to core labs, which I established one at the University of Iowa. What I recognize is that ultimately, a company could be doing this much more efficiently than the core labs. This was the origin of IDT. What I felt was, rather than trying to inflate the cost of your product, drive down the cost through efficiencies that expand the use and the rest of the industry follows along with us. We really led that effort to advocate for the customer. And today experiments that have used hundreds of thousands of polyglutamides would be totally impossible if the cost would never work for. So I'm very impressed with this gentleman who founded that company because by deciding to lower the price from the start, all the industry followed and that made the oligonucleotide affordable for everybody to push that in their lab and do their research. I didn't know that before I joined IDT and I was quite surprised to know that. Started in 1987, as of now, the sun never sets on IDT. We have facilities all over the world. The company is still owned by Dr. Walter. This is his money, this is his company. He started that and grew from that name. So we have 221 million sales in 2016, 65 oligos made per day, 400,000 website visits per month. Why the oligo at IDT are better? What sets up a part of the competitor is the coupling efficiency. Coupling efficiency is the percentage of oligos that are growing on the solid support that receives the next phase. So with something around 95.25% for the product, if you come up with the 120 mer, you would get 41% full end product. And on the industry time there, you get 16%. On our, our IDT Ultramer platform, you get 55%. That means that for a reasonably cheap price, we can make good quality, very long audio. And at that percentage, we don't need to purify that. So if you were in that range, you would purify that it's expensive to HPLC purify and you would lose a lot of material. So because we're able to do good quality audio, that opens the door to use them as raw material for any other 
application that re that relies on oligosynthesis. So we can do next generation probes, we can do synthetic biology, genotyping, qPCR gene expression, CRISPR related material. So this is how we came into the CRISPR business. I'd like to talk about geoblock gene fragment because this is something that involved in CRISPR. Uh, this is simply a double-stranded DNA, uh, DNA sequences. Uh, we take your order, the sequence, we make it and we deliver it. We understand we can do that in your lab, but we believe that you have better use to do with your time. So you can send us the sequence, we make it for you and we ship it. All for relatively really cheap and usually in three business days. So how would we implement CRISPR-Cas9 uh, strategy with these tools? First of all, why would we like to cut a double-stranded DNA? If you have all the setup, the Cas9 would cut, so what's the purpose of that? If you cut the genome of uh, any cell, this is a critical thing and it needs to repair it immediately to survive. So the cell machinery keeps on repairing and the Cas9 keeps on, on, copy, on cutting. On the long term, this is a machinery that is prone to error, so that would generate insertion of deletions on the protein sequence, shift the reading frame and inactivate the protein. So this is a quick and easy way to knock out the gene and this is permanent because it's uh, done at the genomic DNA level, so it's uh, inheritable. You may also insert some pieces of DNA with homology fragments similar, uh, identical to, the, uh, to each and flanking the cut side. So by repairing, the cell takes that and uh, sort of cut and paste it. So you can literally cut and paste pieces of genome together at the site of interest. What do we need to implement that? We need, similar to what was found in the bacteria, we need the, the guide RNA and we need the Cas9 enzyme. There are several ways to do that. We could, if you're a molecular biologist, you would immediately think about cloning that in the plasmid and express. So you could make that a sick, what we call a single guide RNA, clone it in a plasmid, express that in the cell, and you have the RNA. Same thing with the protein, you clone that, put it in the cell, and express that. That has some drawback, and uh, there were some other solutions that were found, but uh, mainly the, the use of lentivirus. This approach with the uh, cloning strategy is quite easy to do, relatively cheap, if you want to have something that has a better capa capability to deliver